so much for being here. We thank everyone who is in this place, those who may join us on the recording later. Welcome to everyone. My name is Sandra Dumont. Um, I'm going to facilitate this service this morning. I think we just start out with our opening statement. There is only one power and one presence in the universe. God the good, all power, ever present, all knowing, and we are one. And our vision statement, we are a spiritual community with a passion to share love, faith, and hope. And our mission statement, we are an accepting, loving, and faith-filled spiritual community that honors all paths to God. For anyone that may have missed it last week, our first Sunday, we had our birthday celebration. We continue to, anybody that has a birthday this month, we continue to send them birthday uh, blessings. And, now we go into a time for announcements and we have a few announcements we are of course operating now on what we're calling a hybrid service and we're going to do that through the month of march anyway we will see what transpires from there things are always changing but for the hybrid service this is being recorded on Zoom, and anyone can participate on Zoom, hopefully 
we will get more and more people who are willing to come and participate in person. This may be a little bit of an unusual Sunday because it is the first Sunday for daylight savings time change. So it may be, uh, some people may be coming in a little bit late. That's a possibility too. So we're just going to go from there. Um, next Saturday is the day of our celebration of life for a longtime member. Glenn Burgess um, at one o'clock on Saturday. It will be an in-person service with safety guidelines, of course, being observed. And there will be no, um, no food or anything beyond a regular service, but everyone that knew Glenn certainly is invited to be here in person and as you know about it, you can be here, just be here in spirit to celebrate the life of a long time member of the church. Number one, we're having a board meeting directly after the service today. And that is in preparation for next week, next Sunday, we are having our annual membership meeting that's going to take place in a Immediately after the service, we're hoping it can be as in-person as possible. And if there are members, the materials have gone out to the voting members. If there are members that can only come on Zoom, they need to let us know as soon as possible about that because we have to set up something special in order to have voting with a hybrid meeting. In other words, the people on Zoom, there are special things that we have to do in order to make it possible for them to vote. We will be having an election for uh, board members. Then let's go directly into the next part of the service, which we added at the beginning of the year. This is based on the 12 powers of man which is a book that was written by Charles Fillmore, one of our co-founders, talking about the 12 power centers that each of us possesses. It's been an interesting study. What, what they have done, what happened after this material was introduced, the 12 powers, each one was assigned to a month of the year that developed into a particular color. And Charles Fillmore had already assigned each to a place in the body where this power resided. Now, this is, of course, all metaphysical, but in the month of March, it's the power is wisdom or judgment, or as we spoke about last week, another word would be discernment. And that power is associated with the disciple of Jesus, James. He was the brother of John. And we'll talk about John next month because he represents the power of love. They work in tandem. It's no coincidence that they were, well, it's a coincidence. It was no accident <laughs> that they were assigned these two powers because they work together. Wisdom or discernment is associated or needs to be associated with love. All these 12 powers work together I did some more reading that I wanted to share on wisdom or judgment. Wis this is from the 12 Powers of Man, the book by Charles Fillmore. Wisdom, justice, judgment are grouped under one head 
in spiritual consciousness. And he refers to Solomon. And when he refers to Solomon, he is referring to the sun man or solar plexus man. The center in the body that's associated with wisdom is the solar plexus. And Solomon, if you break down the word, refers to the sun, the sun man. Also, the color that's associated with this is yellow. Again, no accidents here. Solomon, the sun man, or solar plexus man, when asked by the Lord what he should give him, chose wisdom above riches and honor. Then all the other things were added. Solomon was also a great judge. He had a rare intuition and he used it freely in arriving at his judgments. He did not rest his investigations on mere facts but sought out the inner motives. In the case of the two women who claimed the same infant, he commanded and attended to bring a sword and cut the child in twain and give a half to each woman. Of course, the real mother begged him not to do this, and he knew at once that she was the mother. The appeal of the affectional nature in man for judgment in its highest is in harmony with divine law. We have thought that we were not safe in, treating, in trusting our feelings to guide us in important issues. But spiritual discernment shows that the quick knowing power of man has its seat of action in the breast the breastplates worn by Jewish high priests had 12 stones representing the 12 great powers of the mind. Ready insight into the divine law was the glory of the high priest. And Jesus is called the high priest of God. Intuition, judgment, wisdom, justice, discernment, pure knowing, and profound understanding are natural to man. All these qualities and many more belong to every one of us by and through his divine sonship. I said, ye are gods and all of you sons of the most high, the Christ proclaims in us all. Paul saw Christ waiting at the door of every soul when he wrote, Awake, thou, thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall shine upon thee. And I also want to share some stuff from some information on judgment again, or wisdom. The power is usually called wisdom, but as I say, in this book, wisdom is associated with astonishing clarity, which I thought was an interesting way of putting it. I just want to go through this one where there's affirming wisdom. These are some affirmations for wisdom. And they're very, very simple but sometimes those are the hardest ones to follow. I know what to do and I do it. Divine wisdom now guides me to my next right step and I take it. Divine wisdom inspires me to take the next right step. And again, it's all about that divine wisdom. It's associated with our intuition, our discernment, and it's combined, of course, with love. 
We're not talking about judgment that rules out love. It's judgment that incorporates love. And as I said many times before, none of these powers is functional on its own. They all are interdependent. They are all within each one of us. I'm going to, I want to, to quote a little bit more from here because this is something that kind of follows up on that whole idea of right action. Wisdom inspires not only right action, but right thinking as well. One of the things I do to support thinking right is to cut out inspirational stories or headlines and poems. This is according to the author of this book and what she does. I keep them in a file and pull them out every once in a while when my thinking veers off course. This always seems to tap into my inner resilience. The name of the book is Lessons in Resilience. There are many instances in this book of different kinds of wisdom coming through a number of different people. But I think the important thing, this is, this is a visualization, it's short, it's not a long meditation, but something is saying, use this, close this today. And the meditation in here, visualize wisdom. If you gently close your eyes and take a deep, long breath and picture a crystal clear day, the sun radiating iridescent yellow light against a backdrop of a luminous cerulean blue sky. Breathe the yellow light of the sun into your solar plexus, and in your mind's eyes, see it shining and radiating there. Breathe and draw this sparkling, pulsating yellow light through your whole body from head to toe. See yourself bathed in the vibration of divine wisdom and know that it is ministering to you, spirit, soul, and body. Linger with this vision and feel its energy at work in you. Just visualizing that and sometimes just associating with the color of yellow, that clear, brilliant wisdom from within discernment, judgment, tempered with love, but knowing that that power is within each one of us. And so it is. In the church, we have an offertory basket in the back of the room. We accept offerings, financial offerings at any time through the mail online but this is bigger this is about the offering of ourselves our 12 powers the offering of as mark often says a smile a kind thought an offering is an offering of ourselves and the blessings that we receive and our appreciation of those blessings. And so as we think about those blessings, we go into this time of offering, the offering of music from David, and we start with the blessing that we can recite together, divine love through me, blesses and multiplies 
all that I am, all that I have, all that I give, and all that I receive. Thank you, God. As we give thanks, we ask the blessings of all good things upon each of us here, upon each of those who attend later, who come in on the recording, and those that can't be with us but are here in spirit. We give thanks for the opportunity to come together in whatever way, spiritually, to share our gifts, our talents, our treasures with one another, within this community, and we see those gifts going out and blessing all those that are part of our worldwide community of love. And we say, thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. And amen. I want to introduce the person who is leading our meditation today, Luann Champion, who has led beautiful meditations 
in, in the recent past. And we look forward to this. And her husband will be speaking. Dan will be coming up and speaking to give the lesson. And then we will be opening up for a general discussion and anyone can participate in that. I just, I want to thank you, Luann and Dan, in advance for participating in this way. And what I will do is allow you to go directly into the meditation after the David plays the Lord's Prayer. We will go into that time of meditation and then directly into the time for the lesson. And so with that, I just turn it over to David playing the Lord's Prayer on the piano. And then we go into our meditation. Thank you. See the light inside your heart as you breathe in, expand that light through all of your being. There is a beautiful golden light above your head. As you breathe in, pull that light into your heart. As you exhale, send the golden light throughout your body. As you breathe in and exhale again, expand the golden light beyond the edges of yourself until it includes everyone here. Breathe in once more. And expand that light to include all that may be present with us now.
when Moses stood in front of the bush. There was a golden light before him, as if a fire ablaze. He heard a voice inside that flame. Who are you? Here I am. Go to the people and tell them that I am in the midst of them. Moses said in great awe, who shall I say tells me this? The voice replied, tell them, I am that I am. And deep within the silence, Know that I am that I am. God the good is the one presence of perfect wholeness. It is the perfect light that I am in the image of, and you are. As we gently come back into this space, quietly repeat to yourself, I am one with the consciousness of God's perfect life in me. I am one with the consciousness of God's perfect life in me. As you breathe in, open your eyes, come back to this present space, and know that we are all one, all one. Good morning, my name is Daniel Champion, and I'd like to begin by re relating how back in December I was scanning the newspaper and my, I caught a Dear Amy column and it was a discussion taking place between a teenage girl and her mother. It seems that she had received a very nice gift from her aunt several weeks had gone by and her mother just happened to ask, well, did you thank her? Well, no. Uh, well, I'll just send her a text. And her mother said, you know, in your, my generation and your aunt's that it would be it was very appropriate to send a thank you card. And, uh, and I know your generation just uh, sends a quick text, but I would highly recommend that you do this because when your aunt receives this, it'll warm her heart and she will realize how thankful you were to take the time to send it. This uh, is where I decided I was going to do a talk on gratitude. I've had several months to think, think about this word because it's a word that most people say, yeah, gratitude, thankfulness, 
but they are basically go unconscious most of their life and only in key moments do they give a word of thankfulness and, and gratitude. And that uh, made me recall my first lessons on gratitude. And uh, this would have been in the 40s, of course, and about a week before Christmas, mysterious boxes would appear on our front porch. And they were Christmas gifts from uncles and aunts far away. They would be wrapped in brown paper and uh, they would appear under the Christmas tree on Christmas morning. And when I was young, my mother just said, oh, this is from aunt or so. But at a certain point when I was learning how to write, she sent me down and said, it's time now that you write a thank you note to them. And you had, I had to slow down my frenzy in opening gifts and actually write a note with my mother's help. Of course, being the oldest in the family, this uh, duty of uh, talking about writing gratitude uh, notes uh, became my job to uh, teach my sisters and brothers later on. Um, so I remember at the time, I really didn't want to do it. I wanted to move on and why do I have to do this? And uh, so my lessons on gratitude continued. We didn't, at the dinner table, we didn't often sit as a family because my dad was working a lot. But when we did, it was a very formal occasion to sit down, close our eyes and pray over the food. And to my rec recollection, when our family was together, uh, saying grace at the table was never missed. Uh, giving a blessing at the start of the meal, I'd like to go into that a little more detail. So why do we take the time to, to bless our food? Um, for example, if you eat in a restaurant, um, you don't know who made your food. Maybe they were angry when they made it. Maybe they were not thinking really kind thoughts when they put it together. Maybe uh, the uh, people who grew it uh, did not have loving thoughts. So number one, saying a prayer and blessing your food will have a definite effect on it uh, before you eat it. And uh, it's not really good to just dig in un and go unconscious without a prayer or anything. And I would say in many a restaurant meal, I have done that. And I'm trying to get more conscious uh, no matter what's going on or how hurriedly I eat a meal to say a quick prayer, prayer hold it in my hands and think thoughts of love, joy, and how this food is going to now uh, be changed because there are some scientists that claim that by doing this you will change the molecular structure of the water at least and also the food. Um, I would like to share with you a, a Japanese man, his name was Masaru Emoto. He did some interesting experiments on water and food several years ago. He took a picture of water crystals formed from water that had been exposed to uh, positive emotions like love, hope, and other emotional content. And he found that beautiful crystal formations were, uh, uh, he, he's able to take uh, photographs that were formed from the water. And those that were exposed to negative emotional emotions, and they had some very ugly patterns. So, um, I would like to show you a, uh, if we can, a picture of one of the crystals that he uh, were formed. Can you see that on the screen? Yeah, that's a crystal of uh, water. It looks like a snowflake, and that was from the water that had been blessed with intense feelings of love. And uh, of course, our bodies are mostly made of water. Our Food is, has water as a major component, so you would like, like to think that at the very least you're going to have some effect on the food that you're blessing with good, kind emotions. Blessing our meals 
are, are important for other reasons. And I would like to just mention uh, five key reasons. It brings your attention to the moment of, for eating in a way that provides your phys physical body uh, to pre prepare for digestion. Uh, mindfulness before meals releases hormones and sets your brain uh, to the mode for the enjoyment of the food. Taking a moment to focus before the meal uh, also prepares your physical and emotional body to enjoy the meal and feel fulfilled after you finish it. The positive thinking and blessing of the food, as we mentioned, changes the molecular structure of the water, influencing the fluid cells in food in the way they affect your body and digestion. Blessing your meal brings your attention to the moment. It makes you more conscious of what you are eating and consuming and awakens your body to all the senses, allowing the maximum enjoyment of flavors and tastes. Prayers of gratitude are mentioned often in the Bible. And I found a prayer that used collection of Bible verses and uh, it, uh, they kind of worded it all together and, uh, in, a, in a prayer, and it went like this, and I'll share this with you. Father God, I will rejoice for the day you have given me and give thanks for the work you've given me to do that day. For no matter what happens in these hours, your kingdom cannot be shaken. I give thanks because your love endures forever. You provide everything I need. You are my strength when I have none, and you are my shield when I feel attacked. I thank you because I can abandon my anxious thoughts, for you offer a peace that I cannot understand in my darkest days. You provide rest when I am burdened by life's suffering. I will seek a heart of gratitude. I will be grateful that I am accepted. I will be grateful I am being transformed. I will be grateful that I am loved and that you call me your child. I'd like to uh, go on and say that positive thoughts of gratitude can transform your life. They are the cure for a bad mood, stress, worry, and they move us to feelings of happiness, joy, and contentment. Every action we, uh, we take is the result of our thoughts. They are powerful and shape our lives. Genetics in our environment are not the key determinants of happiness. We are. The way we look at the world determines how we feel. The reason gratitude is so powerful is this principle. What we focus on increases. Gratitude is an essential component of happiness. I would suggest that you write down three things each day that you are grateful for. In 21 days, you'll have a start to setting a new pattern, pattern for neutral pathways, neural pathways. Here are four practical ways to embrace an attitude of gratitude today. One. Cast grateful thoughts backward and forward. What do I mean by that? First thing in the morning, think about one specific thing you are thankful for from yesterday and replay it in your mind. Then think ahead to the one thing you are looking forward to today. The key is to be intentional with this practice and tie it to a daily task so you can remember to do it. Number two, say thanks. Make a point of thanking at least one person each day. This could be by email, in a card, in person, on the phone. And you could praise your colleague, your boss, a client. Sp specific immediate feedback is one of the best management tools because people do more of what they are thanked for. This works in personal relationships too. Number three. Share the grateful words. Set aside a specific 
time to tell someone what you are most grateful for each day. This could be a family member at the dinner table or a friend who becomes your gratitude partner. Take turns describing in detail the best thing about your day and explaining how it made you feel and why. This allows your brain to replay the scene and it doubles your happiness factor. The brain doesn't distinguish between real and replayed version, so you can reap all the psychological benefits twice over. Number four, end the day by writing. Before going to sleep, write down some key things you are thankful for. Aim for three to five, but don't put a limit on them. Journaling has a profound effect on happiness because it replays the positives keeps you focused on what you want and gives you a reference to look back on, which can be handy in challenging times. Once you start, you'll often find that your list is longer than you first ever imagined. It may also initiate ideas for future speech topics, which you can share, creating a positive ripple of gratitude. Another expert on motivation for practicing gratitude I found was a, a man named Dr. Robert Emmons. He studied over 1,000 people from ages 8 through 80 and found that people who practice gratitude consistently reported a host of benefits. And uh, I'll, uh, I kind of put him into probably three areas physical benefits. These people developed stronger immune systems. They were less bothered by aches and pains. They, on an average, had lower blood pressure. They exercised more and they took better care of their health. And they got longer sleep and felt more refreshed upon weakening. The uh, psychological benefits were higher levels of positive emotions more joy and pleasure in life, and they experience more optimism and happiness in life. And the social benefits were more helpful, generous, and compassionate feelings. They became more forgiving. They became more outgoing, and they felt less lonely and isolated. The social benefits especially are significant here because after all, gratitude is a social emotion. It's a relationship strengthening uh, because it requires us to see how we've been supported and affirmed by other people. <clears throat> gratitude allows us to celebrate the present. It magnifies positive emotions. Research on emotion shows that positive emotions do wear off very quickly. Our emotional systems like newness. They like novelty. They like change. We adapt to positive life circumstances so that before too long, the new car, the new spouse, the new house, they don't feel so new and exciting anymore. But gratitude makes us appreciate the value of something, in which we appreciate the value of something, we extract more benefits from it we're less likely to take it for granted. Gratitude um, will block toxic negative emotions such as envy, resentment, regret, these emotions that destroy our happiness. In recent evidence, including a 2008 study by psychologist Alex Wood in the Journal of Research in Personality, showed that gratitude can reduce the frequency and duration of episodes of depression. This makes sense. You cannot feel envious and grateful at the same time. They're incompatible. If you're grateful, you can't resent someone for having something that you don't. These are very different ways of relating to the world, and sure enough, the research this man did uh, suggested that people who have high levels of gratitude have low levels of resentment and envy. Number three, grateful people are more stress resistant. 
There's a number of studies showing that in the face of serious trauma, adversity, and suffering, if people have a grateful disposition, they'll recover more quickly. And he believes gratitude gives people a perspective from which they can interrupt negative life events and help them guard against post-traumatic stress and lasting anxiety. Lastly, grateful people have a higher sense of self-worth. That's because when you're grateful, you have the sense that someone else is looking out for you, someone who else has provided for your well-being. Or you notice a network of relationships, past, present, of people who are responsible for helping where you are right now. In closing, I would like to share with you some great quotes I've found. And the first one, a couple were from Eckhart Tolle. And uh, acknowledging the good that you already have in your life is the foundation for all abundance. And it is through gratitude for the present moment that the spiritual dimensions of your life open up. Dr. Wayne Dyer had a couple of good ones I selected. Be in a state of gratitude for everything that shows up in your life. Be thankful for the storms as well as the smooth sailing. What is the lesson or gift in what you are experiencing right now? Find your joy not in what's missing in your life, but how you can serve. And expressing gratitude for the miracles in your world is one of the best ways to make each moment of your life a special one. The Dalai Lama, he said, whenever you practice gratefulness, there is a sense of respect toward others. And finally, uh, Deepak Chopra, uh, gratitude is a divine attitude in the wisdom traditions. It takes you out of the ego self and takes you into your higher self. That higher state of consciousness indicates self-repair, self-regulation, and healing. So one of my goals in this talk was to bring out that gratitude is more than just a word, and it's when you're going to express it, you should get out of your head, bring your heart and your emotions, and be fully conscious when you do an act or uh, a, uh, an action of gratitude toward yourself or other people. And finally, um, should be your goal to realize when the times of giving gratitude are present, that you'll be aware and not unconscious and those, let those moments go without any kind of gratitude or prayer at all. Thank you. And now it's time to open for discussion. I really appreciate, I have gratitude for the lesson that you presented, Dan. Um, as, as you were talking about blessing food, and I thought, I, I'm glad you expanded on that a little bit later, but when you first came to talking about that, I thought, yes, it changes the food. It changes us and our receptivity to the goodness in that food. And so it, it works in both directions. And I, you know, it's something that, that off and on in my life, you know, have been, it's been very important to do the blessing of food before eating, and then other times don't think anything about it. But bringing it back into my consciousness is really, yeah, it's, it's something that I want to look at seriously. I guess I the thing that I thought about one time, I agree with you, Dan, and I'm glad you reminded me about the food issue. I think I could use some help in that department. Um, but one of the things that I appreciated as I was thinking one time, you know, sometimes when I would argue with my husband when he was alive, I used to think how grateful I was that he came home from Vietnam. And 
I can remember the day that he came home from Vietnam. And I will, you know that that saved me a great many times when I would have thought, this is it. I'm not taking any more of this. <laughs> I'm going to win this argument by leaving. But um, the other thing I wanted to say is I think gratitude brings us in the now. You can't be anywhere else but in the now if you truly are from your heart grateful. You can feel the healing almost inside yourself. And I believe we also heal those people who may have prepared the food that weren't real happy when they were doing it. I think we elevate um, by our nature and all of those things all around us. And what better gift is there for us to give than gratitude other than love? So that's all I have. I'm very grateful that you mentioned the idea about how our emotions like variety. Being an emotional person myself, that sometimes the positive states are very, very fleeting, and I often get attached to them. However, the practice of using more gratitude, even in times of adversity, I believe will really help me out a lot. Thank you. Alrighty, um, this is just a little um, comment that I think the meaning of is something to be taken, you know, seriously like any other aspect of this discussion, but that on the surface it's very sassy. But I was thinking about this presentation that he has made about gratitude and of course that rhymes with attitude and sometimes in our culture we think of the word attitude as having a sassy connotation like i have a kick-ass attitude but when you think about what is kick-ass implies a sense of power and mastery and over your circumstances and so as he is explaining or was explaining the power and the mastery that comes out of being in a state of gratitude, then I would often, would, would thinking of that, would prefer instead of the phrase in our, the common phrase in our culture, the slang, kick-ass attitude, it would be better to say kick-ass gratitude because gratitude kicks ass. And <laughs> that's what I'm saying. I think it means that there's power in gratitude. I want to thank Dan uh, for the lesson and for the reminder that uh, I think we all uh, need, um, whether we're practitioners or um, uh, or procrastinators in the art of, of gratitude. So uh, thank you, plain and simply. Thank you for that reminder. What comes to me is, is relationships. And that, what I'm about to say is kind of weird, but there's this place that's right here that sees us with unconditional love. It brings, will bring you to your knees. And, and in some way, this place likes to create like itself. And we are part of that self-creation. And then when we become gra grateful or gratitude, we have a relationship with what we are grateful for. I like that Dan said, praying with water or praying, being grateful for the water, change the chemistry of the water. And, that, and that's a kind of a reflection of our relationship with God or our relationship with Buddha or whatever you want to call this in that relationship is what we really want. It, it is the relationship of love that's coming forth, and it is our nature. So, I'm feeling very grateful this morning. Um, Belle is a very dear and old friend, and we have somewhat recently reconnected and then been in touch ongoing through um, this Sunday service and our two other small study groups that we join in. 
And I am grateful to all of you for having come into my life um, and my connections with this church. And um, uh, uh, Dan and Luann, you did an amazing job this morning. And um, Mark and Sandra have worked so hard on this and um, Dave for his music. So thank you all for all that you do. So as we come to the close of this service, we all express our gratitude for all those who participated, all those who are here in whatever form, and knowing that we are all blessed and we go forth from here to be the blessings that we are, that we carry within us. Namaste. Namaste.
Thank you.